Okay, thanks for everybody for being here. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. As you know, security is essential to the cloud, and there's lots of tools out there. Uh, not all are equal. And Peter O'Neill will be talking to you about Open Policy Agent, or OPA. Take it away. Cool, thank you, Tim. Cool. Yeah, so today's topic, securing your cloud native stack with policy as code and open policy agent, right? An open policy agent uh, is a tool kind of at the center of, of policy as code, right? And so my name, Peter O'Neill. Uh, I'm the community advocate at the Open Policy Agent Project. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time uh, with the community uh, in Slack and on GitHub and working with the contributors to the project and the maintainers. Um, you can find me just about anywhere on social media with at Peter O'Neill Jr. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the challenge with policy in trying to uh, uh, enforce policies uh, across your stack. We're going to talk a bit about what it means to have uh, unified policy enforcement throughout each of the tools that you're using. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about uh, the policy development lifecycle, right? So being able to, to work on your policies independently of the rest of your application, right? Then I'm going to go over a quick demo of how OPA works and how to write uh, policy as code. And then uh, we're going to finish it off, kind of talk about the Kubernetes admission control use case, this being uh, an open source event. Kubernetes comes up a lot, so I just wanted to briefly touch on what it looks like to implement OPA with Kubernetes. Right, and so, uh, uh, yeah, so the challenge with policy, right? It becomes more and more challenging to implement uh, your policies in your systems as they are continuously changing and all of your tool sets are, uh, are always growing, right? We have a number of languages that developers like to use, right? In, and your application may have any number of these sprinkled throughout them, right? You may have uh, Python for one part of it, you may write Go for, for another part, right? So you have all of these languages, right? And then these are gonna be sitting on different types of infrastructure, right? And you have different tools to control that infrastructure. You could be running on containers uh, in Kubernetes, you could be using Terraform to control this, or CloudFormation, right? So now you have uh, your infrastructure piece, which is a new set of tools, and then these run on top of clouds, right? And then you're connecting databases to all of these. So now we have an application that has right, a large number of tools that you're going to pull together in order to build your cloud native stack, right? So now we have a very uh, complex system, right, where all these tools have to talk to each other. And so now trying to implement policy along the stack now, you have this question of how do I actually right, implement this policy? And right, so just looking at the cloud native landscape, right, you have over a thousand tools to choose from in order to, to build your stack. Right? So now let's look at kind of, kind of, kind of a little more uh, visual, visual how this looks. Right? So now we have on the left hand side here, we have your CI CD pipeline, and then you may choose Kubernetes for container management. Uh, the actual application, microservices themselves, and the databases. You have all of these different components, right? So now, right, any one of these pieces, right, uh, are all of these pieces need, need policy enforcement to some degree, right? And so this is where a tool that's going to do unified policy enforcement comes in, right? This is, this is, this is now, uh, now we're talking about open policy agent being this common tool set that's going to help you uh, work with this large number of tools, or work with a, a, a complex uh, a tool set, right? So now looking at this again, right, what this is going to look like is OPA will start to intercept these requests from these services, right? So now all of a sudden when uh, uh, Jen your Jenkins pipeline needs to make a decision whether it can access your databases, right? This can be, this can be farmed out to OPA. Right, so you don't have to hard code these decisions inside of that application. When your microservice needs, microservice A wants to talk to microservice C, right, you can say, oh, is this within the policy that I've defined for my organization? Right, so now these are all, these questions can all be defined very clearly in a policy that's written inside of your code base, written inside of Git. Right, these are not just uh, uh, theoretical things or things that you're just blocking uh, uh, just arbitrarily. These are things that you are defining with policy uh, and writing them down and storing them in Git. Right, and so how exactly does this work with OPA? So with OPA, we have this policy decision model, right? And so this is the construct of how OPA is going to integrate with these other services, right? So OPA itself is a general purpose policy engine. Right, general purpose being that it is going to work with all of those tools that we talked about, all of those languages, all those databases, right, the infrastructure tools, right, and so to do this, what it has to do is it has to be able to take a query from any of those services at the top, right, 
and those get sent down to OPA, right? So anytime there's a change that needs to happen or a decision for if users should have access, right? All of those decisions that your service needs to make can now be uh, offloaded and sent to OPA. So OPA receives these queries, right? These queries are received as JSON, right? And so JSON is the reason that a lot, or is the reason that OPA is general purpose is because most uh, applications are able to create a JSON object, right? So now all you have to do is reach out to OPA with this JSON object and the data that, that you are using, right? So this, this data could be user data, it could be uh, information from your SSO, like authentication data. It could be the JWT tokens you're using to secure the service, right? These are, you can feed all of this information into that JSON object, give it to OPA. OPA is then going to compare right, the data that it received to the policy that it has and any other uh, 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 database or any other data that, that it has on hand, right? And so now it has uh, the policy and the data, going to compare that to the query in order to decide how to proceed, right? And so this could be uh, a question of should an EC2 instance be created? And so uh, the information that might come in is a JSON object that might say, oh, we have uh, the user, we have the timestamp, we have the location, uh, and we have their, their, their role, right? And then we compare that to the policy and return a decision to that service. Um, yeah. And then so how exactly do you deploy OPA? So OPA itself is a small Go binary. So you're able to uh, deploy this in a number uh, of different ways. Uh, you also want to deploy it as close to the service as possible. So if this is, um, so you can deploy that uh, directly on the host uh, you can run it as a sidecar or a daemon uh, in Linux, or right, because uh, what, what you're going to want to do is remember get that as close to uh, the service as possible. Then, right, most applications are going to talk to OPA via the REST API, being able to ask OPA, sending sending those queries to OPA uh, over HTTP. Right, we also have a Go library if you are building a Go application. Uh, that's that's so it's will feel very native to that application. And then we also have uh, integrations for like Envoy and Istio, and we also have a compiler if you wanna run uh, the policies uh, with WebAssembly, right? So we have a number of things that the community is working on uh, in order to kind of uh, help you get these policy decisions throughout different uh, areas, uh, areas of your, your, your cloud native stack, right? So uh, we want OPA to be this very flexible tool that works for your applications, not trying to make it so you have to adapt how you're doing uh, or what you're doing to OPA. Right, and so let's, let's look at uh, really quickly here the Rego language. So the Rego language is the language that comes with OPA, right? And so Rego is a purpose-built policy language, right? Purpose-built meaning that it was developed alongside OPA as a partner so that you are able to define your policies in a language that is built for them, right? So we decided not to use YAML or JSON or other configuration uh, languages because we needed something that's going to be very robust and be able to right, handle very complex policies, right? Being able to say, hey, right, we are working with very specific data types. We have those JWT tokens. We have the SSO data. We have the stuff. How do we, how do we work with it? How do we modify it? We don't have to start like rewriting uh, how to how to work with cryptography, right? Like you just want that stuff to kind of work. You want built-in functions that are going to handle this, right? If you are working with GraphQL, you want to be able to right take that data in, have a built-in function that's kind of just let you work with that data, so you're not consistently rewriting uh, things that 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 already exist, right? And so our 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 the regular language has about 150 built-in functions. Uh, a lot of them con community contributed. So as community members pick up OPA and Rego, they start to say like, oh, these are our use cases, and these are how we want to use the language. And so they start contributing back and saying, here, we've written these new functions so that other people don't have to do it. Right, and then so kind of just the, some high level constructs here. Right, each policy is placed in a package, and these packages allow you to call upon these rules uh, uh, from other packages, right? And so, so here we see example.rules, uh, and then we have one rule inside of this uh, which is just any API networks, right, equals true. And so that's equals true is the default for any, any rule inside of Rego. And this is a declarative language, so we are declaring that this is true when, these, uh, when, when the lines inside of it uh, are met, right? So as long as everything inside of this rule uh, is true, then the rule is true, right? And so it doesn't necessarily have to equal true. That is the default. It can equal anything that you want it, uh, any other type of uh, a variable or other type of uh, a construct as well. It could be a string, a number, a float, a boolean, or just null. 
and Rego is a, 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 a fully featured programming language, right? So it also comes with unit tests, which are a, a big, a very big component of it, right? Being able to write proper code, being able to write test what you're writing as you're writing it, so that right when you do commit this to to Git and you do want to deploy this stuff, right? You are you are confident with the changes you're making, being able to say like, oh, right, we've added three new rules, and we've added ten new tests, and we know that uh, everything is working as of this point. Right, and then so we have very extensive docs. Uh, with the Open Policy Agent project. Uh, you can check those out, openpolicyagent.org slash docs. Uh, and then we also have a fun tool uh, that's very popular with the community called the Regal Playground. So with the Regal Playground at play.openpolicyagent.org, essentially what you can do here is you can take the Regal policies that you're writing, you can drop them in, right? You can add your inputs and your data uh, files as well, and you can work with this uh, information live right on, uh, right on the site. And then you can share these playgrounds with other people as you are working with, uh, uh, with these policies and trying to figure out how to write them. We use this very extensively in the community to say, oh, when someone's asking for help writing a policy or authoring something that's kind of complex and they're just like, we are working with this kind of data, the easiest thing to do is to say, okay, drop it into the playground and share it with us. And then we can view this information and then work with you, right? And then so this just ends up being a nice medium for community members to uh, communicate with each other and kind of show what they're working on and how exactly it behaves, right? Being able to hit this evaluate button to see which policies are executed and being able to see how it performs in real time, making those adjustments and then kind of sending them back. <clears throat> right, and then so now let's talk a little bit about the policy development lifecycle, right? And so a big part of being, being able to write policy as code <coughs> is, is being able to separate uh, the writing of your policies from uh, writing the rest of your application. You shouldn't need to rebuild your application every time you make a policy change, right? And so, so being able to, to write these policies independently is kind of like step one, right? Having, having your, your policies uh, written in version controlled, uh, writing your regular policies, right? And then deciding like what, what you're going to actually do or what you actually want these policies to do. Right, and then committing these to some sort of CI process where you say, oh, let's now take these policies, build this bundle, and have this policy artifact, right? And so this policy artifact is gonna say like, hey, at this date, at this time, these are what our policies were, and this is how they would have performed, right? So being able to always have that versioned uh, uh, rollback and being able to say like, look, this is what we know, this is how we know it was working, and right, if something does actually go wrong, you could always roll back to uh, an older version or an older artifact before they are uh, deployed, right? And then having, having that deployment process, right, being able to say, like, good Git, GitOps practices and saying, like, yeah, I've checked this in, I have my build artifact, I've rolled it out, right, and then checking to make sure everything is healthy, right? But making that full deployment where uh, checking that all your OPA servers have those latest bun policy bundles, right, and just flowing through this process. Right, and then, as I said, monitoring, making sure that everything is up to date, all the OPAs are working as expected, they have the latest policies, and then logging, right? And I think logging here is something that is very important to most people who are looking at policies. If you're concerned about policies, you're very concerned about you know, the, the historic view of these policies, because at some point, someone's gonna ask you, why did this happen, right? And so with policy, uh, especially OPA, right, being able to track, right, what is a large number of decisions you want to, to to pipe this out somewhere, and so all of these things are, are manageable via the OPA management APIs. So each one of those little OPA servers has management APIs that you can tie into and allows you to, to modify and work with each of these components, right? So there's a logging API, there, there, there is a uh, policy API for bundles to get them in there. There is, right, uh, management APIs for all of these things. Right, and so now we're gonna do a quick little demo. that, open this up, cool, um, all right, so here I have my VS Code that's very small, let's make this bigger, yeah, that looks good. Okay, and uh, yeah, as you may remember from 
the previous lo little, little screen that I showed with the diagram that showed on the bottom there, there was an input <clears throat> uh, and there was a data and there's a policy, uh, right? So the input is the query that we would have received from a service. And so you could think of this as, as someone reaching out to the API. We are, we are doing a get, a get uh, HTTP get request on the path CNCF, right? And the user doing it is Peter, and he has these two roles, right? And so you can imagine this uh, as an API endpoint, you basically just pull that information out, and then it will get sent to OPA. And then this is the policy that OPA has, right? And so we have uh, the package policy, right? This is just the structure of how you contain all of your rules. All of your rules are, right? And so this might be like, you could also say policy dot um, get request or something, right? And so, but this just has one, one package. <clears throat> and then in here, um, right, we have the default rule uh, allow equals false, right? And so allow is just a variable, right? It doesn't have to be allowed. This could be enabled or required or any, any other word that makes you uh, that, that makes sense for the service that you're, you're working with, um, right? And so in here, we're actually saying that for this allow, remember, allow would be equals to true is the, is the default, but you don't have to specify it. Uh, it is the default, right? And then so we see there are two conditions that need to be met in order for allow to be true. The first one here is the input method needs to be get. And then the second one here, um, I'm showing is, is input request.path in data uh, public paths. And so I've actually commented out this line here. So we, we've recently added some new keywords, uh, I think about three versions back, where this line here, input request path equals, uh, equals data public paths, and then this is kind of a loop. It's saying that it exists inside of these paths, but I don't know which one, so just loop through them all. Uh, but now we've added this nifty keyword uh, called in, so now you can just say, uh, the input request path is in the public paths, right? And then, so that's why we're importing this keyword here. And then, so let's actually look at these, right? So input request path, right? So in our in input JSON, uh, the request method is get, right? And then the uh, request uh, path is slash CNCF, right? So here, so in our policy, we can see uh, is get, and then is, so we're expecting it to be inside the data public paths. And so this one is not inside these, these public paths, so I would expect this to not be true. So we can actually uh, run this. That's not the right one. Right, and so here I'm just doing an open eval, putting in that policy, putting in that data, putting in that, uh, that, that, that input file, and we see that the output here is false. So we're saying, oh, um, right, no, this was not allowed, right? So now we can say, oh, let's actually, right, we decided that that is now a, that is now a public path, so we can run that again, right? And that would become true, right? And so being able to roll these things out in kind of, kind of a, a semi-fast semi fashion, uh, being able to modify our policies pretty much on the fly. Um, right, and then the second rule here that we might want to test here is just being able to say, allow these changes if the user is an admin, right? And so if I remove that rule again, save that, right? Go back and that should be false again, right? But now let's actually just make um, the user making the request an admin, right? And just kind of showing that, right? Uh, uh, th these is the expected outputs that we are seeing, are the, the outputs that we're seeing are, are expected, right? And then, Right, so the next thing here that we should, we should start doing is authoring some tests uh, for, for these policies, right? And so now, let's actually say that uh, uh, with any good rule, we're gonna be able to test that, that, that what, what we're seeing is, is what we're expecting, right? And so, so, so with, with OPA, how you're gonna write a test, it's very simple. You just have to preface uh, the rule with the word test, and that's how OPA is going to know that uh, the rule that we're looking at is a test and not an actual rule in the policy. And so here we see tests allow if public path. And so allow, right, this maps to our policy uh, allow rule here, 
right? And we're saying, uh, we're basically saying this is true without saying that that's kind of just implied. And so with the input, and so the input is this uh, input.json, we are now uh, mimicking that in our test file. So we're saying, hey, with input as this JSON object. So now we're, we're swapping out. It's, it knows that uh, for this block that we are looking at this uh, object instead of the actual input. So now, instead of OPA eval, where OPA is evaluating the policies, we can just run an OPA test, testing in this file, and we can see that, oh, this one test is true. And so, but we probably want a couple of different tests, right? This isn't the only test that we would want, right? Let's actually run another one here. Let's, let's do uh, the opposite side case and say, let's deny a public path if it's, if it's not, or, or de let's deny the request if it's not a public path, right? So slash secret is not defined, uh, is not defined as one of our public paths. And so test deny, we're expecting this to be denied, so not allow or denied, right? So we test that and see that that is also true. And then, right, the last thing that I'd probably want to test here is just saying um, allow if admin, right? And so, so as we stated in our policy, basically the, the only thing uh, uh, that, that it needs to be allowed is if the user is an admin, basically that is, that will allow them uh, to do just about anything. So allow with input, delete on slash admin, right, as long as the user role is admin, and that will be the, whoop, gotta save the file, right? And that'll be the last test here. Now we can see, right, all three of our tests are passing here. Cool, and with that, right, that's kind of just a very simple overview of how OPA works and how it works with structured data. And so this is, yes? Uh, right, and so with that, right, we can actually uh, just, right, there are a lot of, lot, of, lot of helper commands here, right, and so, uh, let me see here, makes this a little bit bigger, good question. Right, and so we can actually just, uh, I think dash V is the one that I want, right? And so we can see just a little bit better view of like, okay, it's actually uh, uh, saying like in our data, in policy package, right, this is the actual rule um, that passed and how long it took. So you can kind of do a more verbose output, um, right? So depending on if you're running in this like a CICD or Git or something, right, depending on how much information you actually want to pull out of it, right, you might want verbose or you might just want to pass fail. Uh, but yeah, great question. <laughs> Yes. So when you did the eval, you passed it a lot of the different things. Where is it getting its data from? Is it, is it just like the convention around allowing it? Uh, right, sorry about that. And yeah, uh, uh, the first question I answered before was uh, uh, wh wh how, how do you see which test failed? So showing that with just the dash V command here. Second question here is when I was running OPA eval, how did OPA know what data it was taking in? And so with that, uh, right, OPA eval, right, I actually pass these in with these flags here, right? So, so the dash D, each dash D is just saying like, evaluate with this data. So dash D, I'm passing in the policy, I'm passing in a data object, uh, data.json, and then the input, right? So I'm just, I'm just mimicking the entire uh, flow there by passing in those three objects. Uh, and so it knows that the dash D is data and dash I is input. And so Difference there is just like how it's looking at um, uh, working with that data and how to actually structure it. Test didn't need it because I'm actually replacing the uh, the input file with this with input command, right? And so so the the data command uh, or the the data object um, is actually pulled in there automatically because I'm doing OPA test and I'm just doing dot on this file. Right, so it's just like it's pulling everything in. Right, um, so yeah, question was, uh, wh wh why, did, why did OPA test not need it, uh, but OPA eval did, and so OPA test, I'm just passing in the entire folder structure here. Um, cool, awesome, thank you for the questions, everyone. Um, yes? Yeah, so the question here is, uh, uh, this example was using path-based routing, uh, and what other, what other types of policies can we use uh, that are not path-based? 
Um, right, and so a, a, a very common one is Terraform, right? So Terraform is one where, where there aren't paths, but they are saying like what types of resources can be created. And so with those, you're actually passing in um, the Terraform plan, right, where you're taking a bunch of objects that will be created, and then you're going to look at them and say, oh, evaluate this against a policy that I've defined that says you are allowed to create resources maybe only during working hours or maybe only up to a certain amount, right? Like there might be certain resources that you're just like, these are absolutely out of policy, you cannot create them. Uh, and so you can build guardrails around that type of data as well, right? Structured data is, is kind of key to OPA where, where as long as you're able to have some sort of structured data uh, and convert that to JSON, then it's very easy to feed into OPA. And so, so, things, so things like, uh, yeah, like creating resources or just doing like uh, service to ser microservice to microservice communication where you wanna say like, oh, I wanna send data, then you can actually analyze that data and say like, oh, this is or is not within the policy. Mm -hmm. Cool, does that answer the question? Okay, awesome, sweet. And then, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go back to my slides real quick and then kind of cover uh, one more use case here, which is, uh, let me go full screen mode. Kubernetes and mission control. Um, a lot of Kubernetes fans in the building, so I figured this was, this was a good one. Right, and so with Kubernetes and mission control, right, we're once again talking about uh, structured data because each of the YAML files, uh, obviously YAML, very structured data. Right, and so let's talk a little bit about what happens when you're actually creating uh, an object in Kubernetes, right? So on the left-hand side here, we have a uh, user applying some, some file, app.yaml, Right, and then before that file is actually stored inside of etcd, right, a number of things have to happen, right? That user needs to be authenticated uh, who they are, that user needs to be authorized for the action that they're doing, and then that, that file itself goes through a uh, mutating admission controller where it's going to say like, is, what is it actually going to look like when it's created? And then once you have that final form, you have that validating admission controller that's gonna say, yes, you can be created, or no, you cannot, right? And so each of these, Modules happens in order, and they can happen more than once depending on how you actually, uh, uh, what you actually want to do. So then you might be chaining multiple modules together in order to have the des desired effect that you're looking for, right? And so here are a handful of built-in modules that uh, are pretty popular, right, with like OpenID Connect. You might want to use ABAC or RBAC for your authorization. Uh, you may want to have some, some very standard, uh, like always pull images on the, on the mutating admission controller or right, limits uh, uh, on the validating mission controller, right? And so if the built-in uh, modules aren't, aren't what you wanna do, uh, what you can do instead is, is set up a webhook, right? And so with a webhook, this lends itself very nicely to how OPA works because now you're able to use that HTTP uh, endpoint with OPA and, send, and direct this webhook directly to OPA. So now you're able, OPA's able to to help out with these modules and say, and be able to pass back those decisions, right? And the most common one uh, to extend is this validating admission controller, simply because this validating admission controller is the last step, and it also allows you to build guardrails around what resources can actually be created uh, inside of your, your cluster. <clears throat> right, and so these are going to be uh, these are going to be a, a handful of things that are, are very common, uh, right? Like people using it to block certain images from certain uh, uh, repositories, being able to look for uniqueness uh, uh, across the host and path, being able to replace pod security policies, um, right? Just a bunch of very common things, a very bunch of common like guardrails that people want to put up uh, uh, around Kubernetes while resources are being created. Um, yeah, and so, with that, right, here's kind of a, a simple example, right, showing, a, showing a, 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 the creation of a pod on the left, saying like, we have a simple deny, a deny rule in the center here saying, right, we're looking at that not input.request.object.metadata.labels.costcenter, right, and so we're just looking inside of this object for this metadata, and then we're looking for a label for cost center, which is not there. Right, and so then inside of Kubernetes, we would actually see this error message, right? You're able to return error messages through the validating, or through the, the yeah, the validating admission controller, and then so the user would actually see this message and, right, be able to adjust their, their YAML files uh, uh, and then reapply them. Cool, 
And then thanks for watching. Uh, here are some resources to help you get started. We have uh, on the OPA community, uh, Slack and GitHub is where we hang out a lot. So there are conversations every day in Slack. And we use GitHub discussions and GitHub issues to answer questions uh, for the community. Uh, you, get, you can get a response very quickly there. Uh, on social media, Twitter and LinkedIn. And then we have this, uh, the open docs. As I mentioned before, a great place to get started. It is very, very thorough. There are a lot of pages of docs there. Uh, and then if you get lost in the docs, come over to Slack and ask us for help. And then if you want something a little more structured, uh, the Styra Academy is a free course online. Uh, that shows how to start authoring Rego policies uh, and working with that type of, or uh, working with Rego and, and starting to do that type of uh, uh, work. And then this is me. If you want to add me on Twitter, that's my QR code. Uh, yeah, and thanks for watching. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> cool. And uh, any, other, any other questions before I close it up? Yes. Yeah, and, and so, so as I mentioned, right, it's structured data that we're looking for. So if you have that business, business data in even just like a CSV, right, you can then convert that into JSON and then feed that into OPA, right, and that you're able to evaluate against that, um, right, and then so depending on what kind of policies you want to write against that business data, being able to say like, oh, uh, only authorize uh, these users with these access permissions to do something like that, right, you can, able, you can do a lot of filtering. Um, and so we see a lot of, uh, uh, like, using Rego to filter the data in order to, to do some sort of transformation on it, and then being able to use that for your rule set, right? And so, so that, it, that is something that we do see quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, hey. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a good conference. Mm -hmm.